Um, hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. Um, on behalf of the Center for Tourism Research at Wakayama University in Japan, welcome to the third webinar in the webinar series, Tourism, Sustainability and Recovery, Asia Pacific Expert Outlook. My name is Joseph Chia, and I will be moderating this webinar tonight. I'm currently a professor at the Center for Tourism Research at Wakayama University. Tonight, we're, we're, we're really pleased to welcome an international audience with participants from over 40 different countries across Asia and Pacific, Europe and the Americas. Uh, we are very grateful that you've joined us, especially for those who have had to get up very early or, are staying, or staying awake beyond your usual bedtime. Thank you again. I must make particular mention of some very strong support from participants at a number of universities around the globe, including Batangas State University in the Philippines. Uh, thank you for joining us. And the, and the University of Lapland as well, where we have multiple uh, participants. We also have uh, participants from um, Clemson University in the United States, the University of Queensland, where one of our speakers is from, and the University of Technology Sydney in Australia, Auckland University of Technology New Zealand, Swansea University Wales, Gajamada in Indonesia, National Kaohsiung in Taiwan, and Groningen in the Netherlands. So the Centre for Tourism Research uh, aims to be a key hub for tourism research in the Asia Pacific region, and today, today's webinar is part of that mission. We extend an open invitation to you to visit us at Wakayama. This webinar series is usually run on a monthly basis and will feature speakers at the leading edge of tourism research and practice. And while the focus will be the Asia Pacific region, the overarching emphasis is on global tourism, as you will see. Uh, lastly, we acknowledge the support of our tourism industry partners because without the tourism industry, our research uh, uh, is not able to be applied. So we thank PATA, the Pacific Asia Travel Association, the UNWTO Regional Support Office for Asia and the Pacific here in Japan, and the Kansai Tourism Bureau. So with those introductions out of the way, I'd like to introduce tonight's webinar uh, titled Tourism, Sustainability and Degrowth. We are very fortunate, very fortunate indeed to have two speakers, both exceptional scholars in their own right, and with considerable bodies of work examining broader notions of sustainable tourism, as well as more nuanced insights into particular aspects of global tourism. Importantly, both speakers undertake research that makes important contributions, not just to tourism scholarly understandings, but also to practice as well. At the end of the speaking section of the webinar, we will try our best to have speakers respond to some of the questions raised. So if you have any questions, please send your questions for the speakers via the chat tool. Okay. So without further ado, I'd like to make a very brief introduction of both of today's speakers before handing over to them respectively. Our first speaker today um, will be Professor Richard Sharpley. Uh, most of you uh, will know Richard's work. Um, uh, he is professor, professor of International Development at Central Lancashire University in the UK. He's also a distinguished university professor at the Centre for Tourism Research, Wakayama University. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Mucha Mukono, uh, who's from the University of Queensland. Thanks for joining us too, uh, Mucha. Uh, Mucha lectures in tourism management uh, in the School of Business at the University of Queensland and was previously an Australian Research Council Distinguished Early Career Research Award Fellow. Um, so I'd, I'd like uh, to of all of you to give them a, a silent clap wherever you are. Um, so without further ado then, uh, let's go to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Professor Richard Sharpley. Uh, Richard is, uh, as I said earlier, Professor of Tourism and Development at the University of Central Lancashire and has been uh, Deputy Director at the Centre for Tourism Research here at Wakayama University since 2016. He has held a number of positions at institutions, including the University of Northumbria and the University of Lincoln, where he was Professor of Tourism and Head of Department. Richard is editor of one of the top journals in the tourism discipline, Tourism Planning and Development, and a member of a number of editorial boards as well. Uh, his research interests are within the fields of tourism, development and sociology of tourism, and he's published widely. Most of you will know his books, Tourism and Development, Concepts and Issues with David Telfer in its second edition, Tourism, Tourism and Society in its fifth edition, The Darker Side of Travel, The Theory and Practice of Dark Tourism with Dr. Philip Stone, uh, um, and uh, a research agenda for tourism and development, most recently with David Harrison. But Richard's most recent book was with the colleagues here at the Center for Tourism Research and co-edited with Professor Kumi Kato, Tourism in Japan, Contemporary Perspectives. And with that, I welcome Professor Richard Sharpley. Uh, 
Joseph, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, that, that lovely introduction. Uh, good morning. Sorry, it's, it's good morning from England here. I know for some of you it's afternoon and others it's evening, um, but it's a great pleasure to be here and, uh, and talking to you today. Um, what, what I'm planning to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so is um, the extent to which we need to degrow tourism. Now, this might seem a little bit uh, unusual at a time when the global tourism sector uh, is facing major problems because of coronavirus, uh, at a time when uh, tourism is suffering, there's very little tourism occurring around the world. It, it, it might seem strange for me to be arguing today that uh, what we need to do is to, to, to think about degrowing or reducing uh, the level of tourism on a global scale. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes, is, is to argue that essentially um, the whole concept of sustainable tourism development uh, is, um, uh, I can't, I'm afraid, um, this out, so I can't, uh, I'm having trouble changing my slides at the moment, they're not, uh, they're not moving. Uh, what, what I'm going to argue is that, um, uh, that the concept of sustainable tourism development uh, is no longer viable and that what we need to do is move to a more radical approach to developing tourism around the world, uh, which is based on degrowth. Uh, I'm just again going to try and change this slide because this is um, not working. Uh, Joseph, I don't know if you can hear me or, or AG, could we have this, um, could, could uh, we do something with the slides? Because they're not working. Oh, that's it, lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as many of you know, and as Joseph uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, I, I've been involved in uh, research in tourism probably for 30 years. And 30 years ago, as you are all aware, tourism was a very different uh, phenomenon from what it is today. These are just a few ideas or a few uh, facts about tourism back in 1990 when I started. International arrivals were very low. We didn't enjoy uh, internet or smart technology. There was a very or relatively limited range of products and experiences. Oops, sorry, we're going back through the slides and I'm not sure what's happening. Bear with me. There we go. Uh, of course, we had no low cost carriers. We used to buy our holidays through travel agents. We needed traveler's checks, cash. Do you remember those? Some people taking traveler's checks with us. But the one thing that we did have 30 years ago uh, was the focus on the impacts of tourism. 30 years ago, we were discussing the impacts, the negative consequences of tourism. Um, and, and, and oh, slides going all over the place. And of course, 30 years ago, it was almost exactly 30 years ago that the, the concept of sustainable tourism development uh, also uh, gained popularity. Uh, and although tourism has changed remarkably over the last 30 years to where we understand it today, the one thing which has remained constant has been uh, the concept of sustainable tourism development. The other thing which has been constant from my perspective uh, have been concerns or criticisms of sustainable tourism development. Uh, these I wrote about in a paper published 20 years ago in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism. Uh, th these are essentially what I seem to be the main problems with the concept of sustainable tourism development. Uh, it's ambiguous, it's a malleable concept, uh, which can mean all things to all people. Uh, and the broader concept of sustainable development uh, has been applied to numerous economic, social, uh, political contexts because it is a very malleable concept. It can mean all things to all people, uh, but at the same time, in my view, it is uh, relatively meaningless in many ways. Uh, Perhaps we are delusional in actually focusing on the concept of sustainable development or sustainable tourism development by establishing or setting ourselves the objective of achieving it, we perhaps believe it is achievable, but that is without a full understanding of sustainable development, what it means, what its policies, what its uh, objectives are, uh, and in particular, uh, the, the lack of fit, if you will, between tourism as a specific economic sector and sustainable development as its parental paradigm. I've long argued that the very nature of tourism uh, in, in all its characteristics does not fit with the broader principles of a holistic, futuristic approach uh, that uh, sustainable development demands. Certainly most of the work in sustainable tourism is very tourism centric, um, 
we've lost sight over the last 20 years that what sustainable tourism development should be about is promoting sustainable development through tourism, not purely and simply trying to make tourism itself as an activity environmentally and socially sustainable. Uh, most policies focus on the destination, which means we're missing the wider picture. We focus on a micro solution. Uh, and, and most concerning, I think, for me is that while we in academia have been talking about sustainable tourism development for 20 or 30 years, what has been occurring in practice um, is completely the opposite. Uh, there's been a, a, a lack of connect, in my view, between uh, theory and practice in sustainable tourism development. This is how I concluded my paper 20 years ago, uh, saying that although we do need to encourage more sustainable forms of tourism, it's incumbent on us uh, to, to promote forms of tourism, as with all forms of uh, economic activity, that are environmentally sustainable, um, so we don't destroy the resources upon which tourism depends. But we should stop hiding behind the banner of sustainable development. So what has happened over the last 20 years? Certainly we haven't moved towards what we would hope to be sustainable tourism development. These will all be familiar to you. To you. Certainly by last year, uh, tourism international arrivals, 1.5 billion. Uh, rapid emergence of new destinations, uh, remarkably more than 30 destinations, I think the figure is now 35, receive more than 10 million visitors a year. New markets, primarily in Southeast Asia, all this growth uh, underpinned by uh, liberalization, cheaper transport costs, the neoliberal uh, global economy, essentially. What this has meant is that more and more destinations are becoming increasingly dependent upon tourism, uh, unsustainably so, on tourism as an agent of development. Um, and despite all the, um, despite all the, all, all the policies and processes and, and uh, growth in ecotourism and so on and so forth, there is very limited in practice evidence of the adoption of what could be described, described as responsible tourist behaviour on the part of ourselves, tourists. We are consuming tourism as we do other products uh, in a relatively unsustainable way. Uh, and of course, pre-COVID-19, before this year, uh, there's been increasing evidence of, of, of over-tourism, uh, which, as I'll say in a moment, is it's, it, it's a symptom, not the problem itself. And, and this is the other issue um, that I'd like to emphasise, is that uh, over-tourism is seen as the problem. And, there, uh, and I know Joseph and others have, have published already um, uh, books and, and many articles on over-tourism, suggesting solutions, but in my view, many of these solutions uh, are just solutions which have been proposed for, for decades um, and are really it's, it's, it's old, old solutions uh, to an old problem, not new solutions to, to, to a new problem. Uh, and the, the, the overriding factor, I believe, is, is climate change and global warming. Well, once the issues of uh, coronavirus have hopefully been uh, resolved in terms of tourism, the great challenge remains and will re remain global warming. Uh, and it's within this context that uh, I think we need to move to a, an alternative model. Uh, and the problem, in my view, the fundamental problem of tourism and the fundamental problem of uh, development more generally, sustainable or otherwise, is that uh, at the global, the national, the local level, uh, development policies focus on economic growth. Um, the world is still determined uh, by the economic world, the political world is still driven by a desire to achieve economic growth. Growth typically measured in gross domestic products, either national or at the per capita level. Uh, the belief being that um, if national or the global economy is growing, then that must be a, a good thing. Uh, certainly growth underpins all national development, or most national development policies, there are uh, some exceptions. Uh, and if you actually, uh, explore or examine the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, in some detail. And it's kind of interesting that certainly the UNWTO firmly aligns um, tourism with the SDGs, uh, suggesting that tourism can contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals. Those two are contradictorily based on, uh, in some respects, on, on economic growth. Uh, in fact, some of the SDGs are, are contradictory in terms of uh, environmental parameters, because expecting seven to ten percent growth in developing countries and, and continuing growth in the developed countries is, is environmentally unsustainable. 
Uh, generally, however, economic growth is seen to be commensurate with development and progress, although understandings of what development and progress are uh, are changing. Uh, it is not only about economic growth. That economic growth policy is widely reflected uh, also in the growth-oriented policies uh, within tourism in particular. Uh, it alarms me uh, considerably that the UN, WTO and other organisations continue to celebrate uh, the continuing growth in arrivals as a, as a symbol of the success of tourism. Uh, uh, and research has shown that many, if not all, national tourism policies uh, also focus on growth growth in numbers um, as opposed to qualitative growth um, and I guess that's inevitable because all, all destinations are operating with a, within an increasingly competitive global tourism market uh, but essentially tourism is the policy for tourism is still based on profit profit in the broader sense of not only uh, profits for businesses but profit in terms of uh, jobs uh, income foreign exchange etc etc but it is also based on uh, excessive consumption. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and I've put at the bottom of this slide that the concept of obesity of experience. Certainly those of us who are fortunate to uh, participate in tourism, which is still a relatively small proportion of the global population, uh, are perhaps moving to a, 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 a situation where, where we are experiencing too much, we are seeking and consuming uh, too much tourism, too many experiences. We're perhaps becoming obese on those experiences uh, and unnecessarily so. Uh, now this next slide shows a, a very simplistic um, model of um, the economic growth in, in purely a, a business sense. Uh, the idea you have higher output which leads to increased investment. It, it's relevant to tourism, this leads to higher productivity, increased wages so people spend more leading to rising consumer demand. So both for particular products more generally, uh, this is why the economic growth model is, is seen to be uh, the way forward for development. The belief being that development, sustainable or otherwise, will automatically or organically uh, occur on the basis of that economic growth. But of course, growth in tourism and everything else is dependent upon innovation. And, and I would be the first to agree that the, the tourism sector uh, is one of the most innovative uh, sectors in the world. Uh, much of the growth, much of the expansion of tourism uh, that we've witnessed over the last 30 years has been based on a highly innovative and successful um, tourism industry, uh, which has stimulated demand. But of course, economic growth or continuing growth uh, is dependent, uh, dependent upon increases in demand, uh, increases in consumption. That in turn, arguably, it depends on uh, a belief in that wealth, material wealth, financial wealth, having more, whether in terms of products and goods or indeed in terms of experiences, uh, makes us happier. There's an under, under, underpinning uh, thesis or ethos, if you like, that uh, contemporary development and, and contemporary happiness is based on having more. Uh, and all of the, this depends, of course, on a liberal market-led economy. Uh, that's what drives growth. On the other hand, of course, it is also dependent upon uh, an infinite supply of resources. Uh, to grow continuously uh, means that without the, um, uh, the development of, non of renewable resources uh, and without a reduction in um, pollution, without... Um, a reduction in uh, the waste from all our production going into the environment, uh, the environment itself will suffer. Growth is dependent on an infant supply of resources or um, what is known as absolute or uh, relative decoupling of resources from production. Uh, what that refers to is the, the technocentric approach that believes that we can continue to grow because technology will find solutions to uh, resource issues uh, so, for example, in uh, the airline sector in the UK, it's been claimed that uh, the airline sector will be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, I and many others doubt that very much, that we'll be able to decouple relatively uh, airline travel from, uh, from uh, resource use. So, 
The problem with growth is that it is environmentally, environmentally unsustainable. Uh, constant growth, unless there is absolute decoupling, leads to overproduction and overconsumption. And certainly on a global basis, uh, there is a need to reduce the rate of growth in consumption, particularly in wealthy societies, uh, and in particular to address the problem of climate change, at the global level, there is a need to move towards a more balanced, equitable, steady state uh, of uh, consumption, if not actually a reduction in consumption. Uh, particularly in tourism, some of you might have seen this particular slide before. Uh, tourism is grossly inequitable. Uh, this slide shows the percentage of CO2 emissions uh, for all lifestyle consumption. The richest 10% of the world account for almost 40% of uh, lifestyle uh, consumption emissions. In terms of tourism, the, the, the figure of, for those who fly is about 10% of the world population. The great majority of people who fly, or the majority of flying is actually accounted for by frequent flyers. So those, of you, those who say, well, flying is only three or 4% of uh, global emissions, what we forget is that those who are fortunate, fortunate enough to fly frequently are on a per capita basis accounting for a huge contribution towards uh, CO2 emissions. One flight from uh, UK to New York return, the carbon emissions of that is equivalent to one UK resident's annual total carbon emissions. Uh, we can't uh, excuse flying on the basis of that uh, collectively it's only a small contribution to emissions. Uh, certainly growth in terms of development exacerbates inequalities and other social problems. It doesn't reduce it. I haven't got time to go through all these now, but research shows that in most countries with a high level of economic growth, problems uh, such as inequality, uh, problems related to family breakdown, problems related to drug abuse, crime, those all tend to be higher in those countries with high levels of economic in, uh, of inequality compared to those more equal countries. Uh, and the other thing to remember in terms of, or that I'd like to point out in terms of growth, is that um, a focus on growth detracts from what uh, is currently considered to be development, which is uh, all about well-being, meaningful existence, and achieving prosperity in the more traditional sense of the word, of having hope for the future, of hope of living a, a fulfilled, um, prosperous, meaningful, satisfying uh, existence. So this is um, uh, almost my last slide. What is the solution to the growth problem? Degrowth. What is degrowth? It is not, as, as some belief in terms of tourism, simply reducing at a point in time and place uh, the number of tourists visiting a particular destination. It's a global approach to reducing both the production and consumption demands on um, the, the global ecosystem. On a global scale, reducing uh, production, reducing consumption, alongside uh, a fundamental shift in how we understand consumption, how we understand wealth, and how we understand well-being. So in terms of tourism, uh, what we need to do, in my view, is to reduce tourism's carbon footprint overall. We need to make a significant contribution through tourism to reducing uh, CO2 emissions and this primarily has to be through reducing fossil fuel based travel. Uh, destinational uh, uh, projects are excellent. There are many of them, uh, many projects around the world where, where uh, destinations are acting sustainably, but it's how we get to those destinations. We need to move away, particularly to air travel, reducing, uh, we, need, we need to move away from uh, fossil fuel based travel. All of it taking into account technological innovation. Uh, in transport and fuel technology, uh, but all the evidence at the moment suggests that a, an effective replacement for uh, current fossil fuel based aviation fuel kerosene is, is, is not on the horizon yet. So there are going to be questions, how do we achieve this? Will there be a voluntary adoption of sustainable consumption and lifestyles and tourism? There's the beginning of it in, in Scandinavia with uh, fluke scam, re people re rejecting flying, but I do not think so. I don't think it's going to occur on a global basis, so therefore we will need regulation. Uh, what potential is there for global agreements uh, in terms of reducing flying? Uh, 
Um, those are questions that we can all think about. Uh, and there, of course, there is also the issue to balance global degrowth in tourism with local national development through tourism. I would be the first to, to uh, acknowledge that tourism remains a vital tool for development uh, and that to degrow tourism, it can't be a global, uh, overall it has to be global, but certain countries, certain destinations, certain markets have to degrow to allow other destinations to continue to develop through tourism. Uh, hopefully that has stimulated some thoughts, no doubt it will stimulate some, some questions and some arguments, uh, but for now, thank you very much indeed, and I'll hand you back to Joseph. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, for those of you who might be interested to dig deeper into what Richard just talked about, his uh, recent paper in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, published in 2020, should give you more information and background on that. We have some questions coming through, so if you have any questions for Professor Sharpley, please send them through, and we'll do our best to try and uh, get to them at the end. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Mucha Mukono from the University of Queensland. For those of you who, who know Mucha's work, uh, you will note that she's uh, a very productive researcher, publishing some very provocative and thought-provoking work. Um, Mucha is a lecturer in tourism uh, management at the University of Queensland, which is uh, currently ranked as Australia's number one um, school of tourism. She recently completed an Australian Research Council Distinguished Early Career Research Award project. For those of you who don't know what, a, what an ARC DECRA project is, it's probably the gold standard for researchers in Australia. Um, so, um, uh, Mucha's work was uh, centered on the role of cyber activism in bringing attention to the ethical questions surrounding trophy hunting tourism in Africa. The project uh, led to an invitation to testify as an expert witness at a legislative hearing of the US House of Representatives Committee on Natural Resources and the Cecil Act, Cecil after Cecil the Lion, most of you might know. Um, and the video is on YouTube. I watched it the other day, which uh, I was very impressed. Um, so much has published on a range of sustainability and ethical ethicality themes relating to tourism consumption, a good follow up uh, from Richard. The bulk of her work is focused on the role of digital communities in the contestation of these themes. Um, uh, and in particular, Mucha employs ethnography in her work, which applies the in-person participant observation techniques of anthropology to the study of interactions and experiences manifesting through digital communications. Mucha, uh, in 2020, Mucha's published a lot of work in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, the Journal of Tourism Futures, Annals of Tourism Research, and the Journal of Sustainable Tourism as well as a, a landmark book, Positive Tourism in Africa, published in 2019. So if we don't have time to ask much of the questions today, or we don't have time, she doesn't have time to cover everything, I'm sure you can find a lot of uh, uh, extension on what she's about to say today in her work. So I hand over to you now, Mucha. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joseph. I'm really uh, grateful to, to be part of this webinar. And uh, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I will now try to uh, share my screen um, and show you a few slides that I have prepared. Uh, okay. Bear with me. All right, my apologies there. So um, thank you once again. So um, listening to Professor Shapley, um, I suppose um, he uh, reflects on the last 20 years since uh, the publication of his work on, um, on the prospects for sustainable tourism development. Um, and I suppose my perspective is to look at the present and, uh, and um, sort of ask questions that I think are per pertinent for, um, you know, going forward. So from reflecting on the last 20 years, if you like, to then looking at the next 20 years. So I want to start by emphasizing that I really don't want to pretend to have answers here. Um, I do not have all the answers. What I do pose are questions that I think are important. And I think questions that we will have to confront, that we'll have to contend with um, going forward. 
And so what I've tried to do today is to sort of capture some of the major themes in, in some of my uh, recent work which sort of set a foundation for what I believe will be those important questions going forward. So what really fascinates me um, in considering this, this future of sustainability, this future of sustainable tourism, is the young generation, because these are going to be the people who will set the agenda going forward. Um, so in particular, I'm interested in the um, experiences and the perspectives of Generation Z. Generation Z are the, uh, the generation who are born from 1995 onwards. And I think it's fair to say that these, uh, this generation are young people who are taking matters into their own hands. They are not happy to sit by the sidelines and watch. Uh, they are saying, you know, we are going to do what we can to create the future that we want. So this is the generation that really interests me when it comes to the question of sustainability, because I really see them as um, prepared to draw their own uh, benchmarks and to rewrite the rule book for sustainability. Um, and of course, the name Greta Thunberg, uh, Thunberg uh, comes to mind. She personifies this spirit of young people who are taking matters into their own hands. So this is what really fascinates me. And and this is a theme that I intend to explore going forward because I think it will shape the future of sustainability, whether that's in tourism or more broadly. And so I have a, I have a real interest in environmentalism or more specifically uh, environmental activism. Some of you who are on Trinet like myself would have seen in recent um, weeks uh, a debate raging on, uh, on, 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 on Greta Thunberg um, and what she represents. Uh, with you know, some um, very enthusiastic about what, uh, what she represents, uh, what her generation represents and her views and others not quite so keen. And that image on the right, I think is a, uh, an apt uh, um, representation of what was going on in, on Trinet. My point really is that uh, young people are taking center stage. We are taking notice whether we agree with them or not. So this, these are themes that interest me in particular. So with that realization, with the realization that young people are taking center stage, taking matters into their own hands, and then also realizing their use of social media, right? So you cannot separate young people's experience, lived experience from social media. You cannot separate their activism from social media either. So I locate social media at the center of a lot of the work that I'm doing because it just makes sense to do so. However, there are challenges with that. The first is obvious, the tribalism that social media tends to generate. We see this in political spheres. Indeed, we see this in all spheres of, uh, of life as we know it. So unfortunately, um, um, Social media has this um, tendency, uh, as Kuma et al. put it, to create eco, uh, sorry, echo chambers, right? So um, it leads to polarization where you have two extremes screaming at each other and barely listening to each other. So you have this exaggerated partisanship in social media. And unfortunately, young people are caught up in that. So in my view, this is not conducive to healthy debate because then you have um, um, villains and hypocrites. You have these tribes where the other group are the villains, the other group are the um, hypocrites. So I see this as something that is unfortunate, but something that we have to recognize as a reality of our time, including when we consider issues around sustainability and the role that young people will continue to play. So that's number one, that's a challenge. That's a question that we will have to contend with. The second one is a sense of generational wars. So Greta Thunberg, who I obviously will continue to uh, uh, refer to, um, is famously quoted as having uh, said, um, how dare you? And she is addressing here leaders, but she's also addressing generations before her. 
and she's saying you have failed us. So unfortunately, what this has done is to precipitate uh, a generational war between the greater generation, if you don't mind me putting it that way, and the rest. So for example, these days we, we hear people talking about boomers versus uh, Generation Z versus Generation Y and so forth. So these generation wars, in my view, are again, not helpful. So this is a second theme, a second challenge that I am very much interested in in my work when considering these issues around um, sustainable. So the question becomes, how do we bridge that generational divide so that we can, younger people can learn from you know, the, the generation's experiences and the other generations can also listen to young people. Uh, here I refer you to uh, a paper I published with Professor Karen News and a colleague uh, here at UQ uh, where I talk about um, responses to Greta Thunberg's activism. Right, so again, unpacking this, uh, gener this greater generation, this, this generation that I'm calling the greater generation, we see new forms of activism becoming uh, mainstream, becoming louder and louder across the globe. So an example here is the flight shaming movement, the movement where people you know, um, are made to feel a certain level of shame for choosing to fly, as opposed, for example, uh, to choosing to take the train. Um, the greater generation is known for the Fridays for Future uh, climate strike, which they hold on, on, on Fridays outside of COVID anyway, right? And all of these are symptomatic of the rising eco-anxiety among young people. So, so I think this is a very interesting trend that will again continue to shape the future of sustainability in tourism and beyond. These new movements that young people are pioneering. Now, coming to the subject of degrowth, with which Professor Shapley has um, discussed, I have to say this one leaves me a little bit unsure. So my question is, are young people receptive to this? Because they are, after all, the future. If this is going to work, if this idea is going to be um, you know, is going to be accepted and embraced, the young people would have to be the ones who must be most enthusiastic about it. Unfortunately, I have to say, in my observation, and I've, I've done a little study with some of my students to try and see where their minds sit, they belong to this Generation Z. And what I have found is that they are not particularly keen on this. They are willing to make tiny little adjustments to their everyday lives where they do not feel a sense of uh, inconvenience associated with that adjustment. But they are not willing to make big personal sacrifices such as traveling less, such as giving up the idea of traveling to some far, far away destination. So this makes me slightly unsure about this concept of degrowth because I, I do not see the buy-in from the younger generations. So the question is then asked, are young people just virtue signalers? You might say that's an unfair question, but I think it's a fair question. You know, on one hand, the enthusiasm to, to guarantee those sustainable futures and to say to the older generations, you need to do better, you have failed us. But then when, it can't, when the question is given to them, are you willing to make big adjustments to your consumption, including your consumption of, of tourism, including your flying behavior? What I do sense is some reluctance. So this is a contradiction of sorts that I am uh, still trying to process. What I have found uh, as an interesting trend in reflecting on this generation is that if I were to describe them, and here I'm using Stefan as model uh, of green environmentalism. So Stefan, Stefan comes up with these three categories, what he describes as dark green environmentalism, uh, light green environmentalism, and bright green environmentalism. In, in, in the interest of time, I'll just talk about uh, bright, bright green. So bright green environmentalism is the type of environmentalism where people believe that technology is going to be our savior. So they have this optimism that we will have in future 
um, technologies that allow us to have our cake and eat it too. So these are technologies that, for instance, will cut down uh, carbon emissions so that we do not have to give up travel. We can still travel as much as we like, but we will just have the, you know, the, 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 a much better plane that doesn't pollute, for example, to use an extreme example. But these are people who see technology as holding the answer. So they are just waiting. You know, it's a waiting game until we have those technologies that allow us to continue with the consumption that we have, the levels of consumption that we have, um, while not damaging the climate. Whether that is a fantasy, I think that's a question for another day. But this is where I see a lot of young people sort of gravitating towards this belief that technology can reconcile these seemingly conflicting uh, sort of um, choices and priorities. So uh, here again, I refer you to a work that I, I, um, I wrote with uh, prof uh, Associate Professor Karen Hughes, where we discuss feelings of eco guilt and eco shame in tourism consumption. What is it that causes people to feel levels of shame, levels of guilt, and how does that impact their, um, their behavior, for instance, their behavior in, um, in air travel, right? So, um, so these are some of the themes that I have identified in, in some of my recent work. And these, I think, capture some of the questions and probably some of the uncomfortable uh, contradictions that we have to contend with um, as we consider the next 20 years. So the last 20 years have not exactly delivered, I think, uh, Professor Shapley has painted that very clearly. They have not delivered what everybody was hoping, maybe unsurprisingly. But now looking forward, um, we have yet uh, more uh, complex questions. And so, yeah, my fascination is, is with this Generation Z who are so eager to reset the agenda, and yet the answers are not quite simple. So thank you. I will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Mucha. Um, Everyone participating, give her a silent clap in your own living rooms there. Thanks, thanks again. Um, we've been having a few questions come through and we've also had questions sent prior to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the webinar. So if we can't get through all of the questions, we apologize in advance. The answers, however, will be found in, in both uh, uh, Professor Sharpley and Dr. McConnell's work if you, if you, if you uh, refer to the readings that have been quoted. Okay, the first question I think we'll pose to probably to you, Mucha. It's from Judith, who's a PhD student at the University of Brighton in the UK. Thanks for joining us, Judith. Um, Judith says, Mucha, I'm interested to hear your views on travel shaming, example, flight shaming or eco shaming. Could travel shaming be used as a form of nudging to decrease tourist activity and drive the degrowth agenda forward? How could this be done? Judith, um, you have asked a very difficult question. Uh, so could flight shaming be, be used to nudge people into acting um, more sustainably? You know, this question actually um, resonates with, with, with that study that I did with Professor Karen Hughes, where we talk about these feelings of shame and feelings of guilt. And what I found really interesting is that certain cultures seem more prone to shame than others. Right, so certain cultures are much more likely to express a sense of shame about acting a certain way, whereas other cultures, not so much. However, what we did find is that even where there is shame, even where there is shame, this does not necessarily translate into somebody either expressing a desire to change their behavior or changing their behavior at all. So it seems to me that what we are able to feel is not necessarily a driver of how we will act. So I don't know that um, you know, shaming people is a, an effective way of inducing better behavior. If anything, I suspect that people, you know, when you shame people, there's a part of us that rebels. There's a part of us that says, how dare you stop me? You know, who do you think you are that, you know, so, so shame, I don't see as an effective uh, tool. What, you know, if I were to just go by my intuition, I would say, you know, it's probably introspection and a sense of personal conviction that is, you know, more powerful. If it's coming from someone else, 
they are a hypocrite. How dare you point fingers at me? So I have to say, Judith, I don't, I don't have quite a, you know, an exact answer for you, but I doubt very much that shame is a useful uh, tool for that. <laughs> Thank you, Mucha. Uh, probably some good advice for those who are parents of little kids, right? Um, uh, the, so the next question uh, is for you, Richard. It's from Maximilian Schachner. And, and he, t he asks a very important question uh, that's pertinent in COVID-19 times, right? He says, would degrowth necessarily mean for developed Western societies to abstain from the benefits and pleasures of tourism in order to not jeopardize the legitimate growth and participation options of developing societies? Uh, the, the quick answer to that is yes. Um, the, 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 the biggest challenge facing the world, um, I believe, is inequality. And that's very much in, in terms of development, in terms of access to particular activities such as tourism. Um, uh, and, and I generally believe that there is a need to rebalance um, overall activity participation in tourism and benefits from tourism to benefit uh, the less developed parts of the world, those countries which still require tourism and tourists for the benefits it, they bring. Um, whilst uh, those of us in the more privileged parts of the world, uh, particularly North America, uh, Europe, uh, and, and to a growing extent, uh, Southeast Asia now, uh, where uh, we can perhaps afford uh, as nations and as economies to, to have a, a reduced level of tourism rel rel relative to the overall economy. So, so what I'm saying is that, you know, that there is the opportunity, I believe, just to rebalance tourism on a global basis. Um, but the big question then is how you would do that in terms of global agreements, which even in terms of global warming, we're not particularly close to, or climate change. Um, but uh, when we look at the global environment as a whole, the global ecosystem and, and its finite resources, uh, for the world to move towards a more equitable basis in terms of development, um, ideally or idealistically, um, that there is a need for uh, the more wealthy countries and more developed countries to slow down uh, and to, to consume less including in tourism, to, 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 to enable less developed countries to, to, to catch up. But it's not a matter of developed countries catching up with the West where we are now as we continue to develop. Uh, it, it's, it's a moving together in the middle. So, so I hope that answers the question. It, it's idealistic, I know. Nobody, including myself, wants to give up anything uh, in terms of what we enjoy in terms of material and benefits, material income, etc. Um, but... Uh, without significant technological change, I think that will have to happen. Okay, thank you, Richard. Mocha, did you want to comment on that or on that question? Uh, maybe a little bit later. I'm still okay. processing that okay. one. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. The, uh, the next question is from Marina. Um, I'm hoping to pronounce your name correctly, Marina. Marina Subiru. Uh, she says, I have a question for Mocha. What are the indicators that young people are not willing to buy or consume less? She says that uh, if you look at study, several global stu value studies, it's clear that since the 2000s, uh, there's been a global moral transition towards prioritizing environment over wealth and financial growth. Um, so the, 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 the leading question was, can you comment on what indicators there are that show that young people are not willing to buy or consume less? Uh, I think what we, what we don't have in terms of evidence, uh, Marina, is um, studies of a scale that will allow us to make, um, you know, generalizations that are also valid. You know, what we tend to have is very small scale, very context specific studies. So if I went and did a study somewhere in, in Southeast Asia, I might come up with a particular impression if I did a little study as I have done with some of my students, I might come up with a particular impression. And then if I did a study in, in, in the UK, for example, you know, these cohorts are very different. Culturally, they are very different. The socialization that they are getting is very different. Uh, the discourse in the communities where they are living also varies. And certainly if you went to Africa, you know, you might find very, very different uh, perspectives from young people there. 
right, who might not necessarily identify with any of the themes that I've been talking about today, right? So we make generalizations, you know, because we have to sometimes, but so I'm sure you will find um, studies uh, that will indicate that young people are indeed willing to make, uh, you know, to consume less. But then I would question what the context of that study is. I'd be interested to see what the, you know, specific characteristics of that sample look like, right? So I think here perhaps maybe your question really is a caution to us um, about making maybe some of these grand statements. And, and that's probably what I did. I did make a grand statement. But perhaps what I'm trying to allude to is that maybe uh, the pace at which we are willing to accept change, especially change that costs us something, is not quite at the same rate as the pace, you know, at which we are enthusiastic to, to, to embrace these, these, these <laughs> ideas, right? So, so there is a gap there between our behavior and what we believe. And I guess this is, you know, the million dollar question, how do we get those two things to get closer to each other? So maybe, I, you know, I should say thank you, Marina, because I think that's an important caution. Thank you, Mucha. Richard, go ahead. Can I just briefly add to that? Uh, and, um, like Mucha, I, I did a, one of my students did a, a survey over the summer of um, Generation Z amongst students at, at my university. This very question about the meaning of tourism to them. Uh, and what was perhaps unsurprising, but a little shocking, is that without, almost without exception, they all said the only thing that is stopping them from traveling as much as they could are uh, financial, financial concerns. If they had the money, they would travel, travel, and travel. Absolutely. Which kind of suggests generations that aren't going to be consuming much less than the boomers and generation X and Y. <laughs> so we have a huge challenge, actually. Thank you, Richard. I can hear all the Generation Zs participating, wanting, yelling at their computer, saying, that's not true, Richard. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the, the point that you both make is that, you know, um, there are contradictions and a whole lot of complexity uh, behind all of these questions, right? So the next question is a really important one, because while we're all talking about tourism at the moment, global tourism has more or less come to a, a grinding halt, right? So this question is from Monique Saint-Tropez at La Trobe University in Australia. She says, how do we ensure that tourism as an industry emerges as more socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable once commercial travel resumes after this pandemic? Because presumably tourism will continue perhaps after a vaccine is discovered. Maybe it will be business as usual. So the question then is how can we ensure that tourism emerges as more socially inclusive and more environmentally sustainable. Do you want me to answer that? I'll, I'll have a first go. <laughs> um, yes. I, I, I'm a fairly, once a vaccine is produced, which I very much hope it will be, um, you know, all the indications will be that um, it, business will return to normal in tourism. There was, there was a long discussion on Trinet about the new world of tourism post COVID. Uh, you know, I, I remain quite cynical about a lot, a lot of that. And certainly the, the response in Europe has demonstrated that actually it's back to business as usual. I mean, the, the, the growth in tourism until they started closing down all the air bridges was quite remarkable. But the, the question is actually the question that we've been addressing for the last 30 years through sustainable tourism. That, that's what sustainable tourism has been about, is making tourism, developing tourism, so it's more socially inclusive in, uh, in terms of community tourism, in, in terms of its developmental contribution and everything else. And sustainable tourism has also been about making tourism more environmentally sound. Um, and we haven't got there. You know, after 30 years, we really haven't got there. And that's, that's, that's my main point. Um, despite all the policies, all the processes, all the global organizations uh, promoting sustainable tourism development, it's not happened. So, so, the, so the answer to the question is that um, history says we can't get there. So we have to do something much more radical, both in terms of tourism and consumption more generally, which is to reassess how we live our lives, what is important to us uh, in terms of consumption, in terms of what we have. Um, tourism being one of many forms of our, our contemporary consumption. Um, and I fear the only way we're going to achieve that, um, and we've had this conversation, Joseph, in the past, is, is through regulation. Uh, you know, it happened with plastic bags in, in the UK. Uh, it happens with all sorts of things. Um, and that is, unfortunately, I think the only way forward which is a, a very negative response, I know. Um, but, but I fear the most realistic one. Okay. 
we have a flood of questions coming through, but just an extension to your response, Richard, and this is a message for, for Mucha, particularly with your work around trophy hunting and behavior change, because what we're all saying here is that for things to change, we need to change our behavior. Professor Sharpie talks about reducing consumption, which is essentially behavior change. So when it comes to trophy hunting and behavior change, for most of us sitting back, looking at these pictures of hunters and their, and their trophies, it becomes quite apparent to us that for some people, the, <laughs> these kinds of activities are not appalling as most of us think. How do we change, if, when it comes to trophy hunting, how has behavior changed in that regard, Mucha? So again, this, this takes us back to this, that idea that I talked about earlier about polarities, and they seem to be exacerbated by the social media culture that we have. So I, I can tell you now, I just completed this, this project uh, in, Feb, in February. I was so burnt out, not because it was a lot of work, but because I found myself in the middle of this thing with one camp here and one camp here and nobody in the middle. So unfortunately, people are so committed to their church, you know, and I use that metaphorically, of course, People are so committed to the, to, you know, to the doctrine that they are worshiping of their church. So if they are hunters, they will die hunters and proudly so. And then if they are never hunters, you know, likewise. So unfortunately, with certain issues in hunt, hunting, uh, trophy hunting specifically, is probably, you know, the, the best example of this phenomenon, this quite negative phenomenon, that you've got these extremes, right? and people are just committed. So in terms of behavior change, uh, Joseph, there is none, <laughs> there is none. And perhaps that's where only regulation, legislation makes a difference. So for instance, you cannot stop a hunter who loves hunting, going to hunt at a destination that has legal hunting. But if you are Australia, what you can do is you can deter the hunter by making making it difficult or making it impossible for them to bring the trophy back home, right? So yeah, when everything fails, regulation, <laughs> legislation, you know, but, and then you force, you force it on somebody. But in terms of voluntary uh, behavioral change, and, and here I include myself, that's a hard ask, right? That's a hard ask because it requires, in my view, cultural shifts that happen very slowly and very painfully, but very, very slowly. Okay. Thank you, Mucha. Um, really, the polarization is no different to um, an academic conference to some degree, right? We, we have our ideas and, <laughs> and we argue about it. Um, okay. The next question comes from Dominique Lapointe, Professor Do Lapointe in uh, Quebec. Uh, hello, Dominique. Um, Dominique's question is, thank you very much to both of you for two great talks. I would like to know how you consider social justice and degrowth, knowing that degrowth of tourism will mean restructuring tourism dependent economies. Gosh, um, that, that, that's a huge question, which I don't think can be really answered in, in, in probably the one or two minutes we've got left. Um, degrowing tourism, particularly for tourism dependent economies will be a, a, a huge issue. Now, I'm not sure entirely what context, um, uh, the context, the concept of social justice is being, um, being applied here. Uh, but my view is in terms of social justice in, a, in, in allowing or developing tourism to the extent that uh, those economies dependent on tourism can remain dependent upon tourism, uh, or, or, or that, that dependency is recognised, then I think it comes back to this idea of rebalancing tourism. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question itself, but uh, we, we need to maintain uh, forms of tourism uh, in tourism-dependent countries, which perhaps move to a more um, inclusive, less traditional mass kind of tourism, uh, so there's more community focus within that at the same time as trying to, to maintain the level of tourism that those countries depend on. I don't think that answers the question at all, actually, Joseph, but, um, <laughs> but, but I hope that goes some way to, to stimulating some thought. Well, it's, it's, it's a, there's a whole PhD topic in that, Richard. There is, yes. Maybe, maybe not too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mucha, did you want to comment on that? Social justice yeah. and degrowth? Absolutely. So um, 
you know, I think one thing we have to keep reminding ourselves is that perhaps the way we are framing this, um, you know, these themes that we're discussing tonight, we're probably taking a particular bias, and I think it's very clearly a Western bias. This idea of decrow, I'm yet to come across it in, um, you know, let's say from, from an African perspective. I think it would sound so foreign, it may be even ridiculous to, you know, African countries, for example, that really, really desperately want dollars from tourism and which, you know, countries which just focused uh, on growth because they need it, right? Because, because it's important to their economies, et cetera. They really don't have very many alternatives. So in terms of social justice, I can't think of anything, you know, more fundamental in, in sort of understanding their perspective than recognizing that we, you know, a lot of these ideas will not translate in, Af in Africa or other parts of the world. Um, and will certainly not be received with enthusiasm. So I think this, you know, this is very relevant to point out. And that is part of the pursuit of social justice in terms of, you know, they need the money and they you know, the, the, a lot of their communities, community-based tourism and things like that, pro-poor tourism, you know, that's part of social justice. So, so at some level, deep growth is not necessarily compatible, at least in some context. So I think tonight, if I were to emphasize something, I think context matters. Perhaps that's something I would want to kind of yeah. uh, throw in there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's also something that you've touched on, Richard, where you talk about the global north reducing their consumption and in some way redistributing resources across from the global north to the global south, right? Um, yeah. But that's... that's, that's I mean, it's a huge ask, you know, and, it, and it, it's basically asking, you know, a third of the world's population to, to completely re reassess how, how, how we live our lives. Um, but, but it relates to sort of broader reconceptualizations of what we understand it to be developed and, and to live fulfilled, satisfied lives. Yes. Uh, and still are in, in, the, in the North, for most people, uh, a, a, a successful life is a, a rich, in the narrow sense of the word, life. Um, whereas I, Increasingly, you know, development studies, uh, the understanding of development is moving towards the idea that actually well-being, a sense of achievement, a sense of satisfaction uh, is inevitably much more than wealth. Uh, and study research also shows, shows that increasing wealth, um, you may get uh, economic growth, but you actually get social recession. In other words, in many developed countries where there is rapid economic growth, which tends to be accompanied by increasing inequality. Most Western countries, apart from Scandinavia and actually Japan, um, which are relatively equal in terms of income uh, across, you know, across society. It, does, it, there's no, it, it, it There's no coincidence that in Scandinavia and in Japan, as I understand it, which are, are more equal in terms of income, uh, that they are, however you define it, happier societies. You know, they, they tend to suffer less or fewer problems than we do in more unequal societies. And, and the issues that are occurring in America and occurring in this country in terms of uh, a whole range of social issues uh, have been directly linked to um, the inequality that is, a, is an outcome of excessive or, or, or high growth rate. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, if, if we can move to an understanding where actually uh, progress and success and happiness can be based on a whole range of other things, uh, community commitment, living fulfilled, living a fulfilled life, doing something with our lives that is, is you know, for others, being part of society, um, it, to me, is much more important. And if, if that is part of reducing uh, our consumption, um, including through tourism, I mean, I mean, colleagues of ours have done research which shows that if you have three holidays a year, you're no more happier than having one holiday a year. I mean, I know it's a simplistic thing, but, but that, those additional holidays don't make you any happier. We're collecting stamps and passports. Uh, and, and, and so it's so it's it's all part of this broader argument that if we're going to live a sustainable life environmentally, and that's what sustainability is all about. Nothing more, nothing less than, than ensuring that the, 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 the human race can survive on this beautiful planet of ours. Um, we, we need to consume less. Which Thank you, Richard. Really Sorry, that was a rant. No, I'm no, no problem. It's, it's, it's a very big question that deserves a much longer answer, but we don't have the luxury of time.
I've just looked at the chat and 27 new messages, presumably 27 new questions have come up. I'm sorry we won't be able to go to all of the questions, but I'll try and jump to some of the very brief questions and paraphrase them so that they can be responded to relatively quickly, Richard and Mucha. Um, Professor Carolyn Funk from Hiroshima University. Hello, Carolyn. Thanks for posting your question. Carolyn asks a question about, essentially about the democratization of travel. If we're talking about degrowing travel, to what extent do we only make travel, especially, I think she refers to international travel, available only to those who can afford to pay for it? Um, hello, Caroline, <laughs> nice to hear from you. Um, thus it ever was, is the answer. <laughs> you know, tourism always was an elitist activity. It still is in global terms, international travel. Um, uh, and it's going to become that, even without the kind of things we're talking about, you know, airline, air travel is going to be, post-COVID, airline travel will, will be much more expensive. There is no doubt that, you know, the, the, the days of cheap air travel are, are gone. So travel will become elitist again, international travel. Okay. A question for both of you uh, in relation to community-based tourism, something that's often linked to sustainable tourism and promoted as the you know, as the, as the panacea to, um, uh, to all of the negativities that come from tourism, how can community-based tourism uh, be, be more linked to sustainable tourism? Can it? I'll let, I'll let Mucha answer that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, look, speaking from um, my observations in my country of birth, which is Zimbabwe, um, there were high hopes for community-based tourism. Zimbabwe is probably a worst case scenario, but it's, it's, it's still a, an example. There were high hopes for community-based tourism as a way um, of you know, advancing uh, livelihoods in, in rural, very impoverished communities. But again, like sustainable tourism development, you know, um, it has not delivered. And what you see is people are poorer or just as poor as, as they've always been, even after 30, 40, 50 years of having tourism in their community. And I have to say, for me, that is my sore spot. You know, that, that's where I really feel that we should do better. Who is responsible for that lack of progress? I mean, that's a question we'll have to, to leave for another day. But um, if we were to um, direct our energy somewhere, that would be a worthwhile project. That which is to really try and see how we can better the lives of people who really need it. And then we can talk about, you know, other sort of more elite questions, sort of our first world problems later. But there, there is actual need, there are urgent uh, uh, issues. Um, maybe we ask too much of tourism, maybe that's what we do. Maybe we expect too much from tourism. And I have to say, Joseph, can, if I can just add this quickly before shutting up. I really think that we are, ex we are, we are, we are sort of like, um, we are too optimistic about what uh, the coronavirus, the pandemic is going to do for tourism. I've seen a lot of people saying, you know, how it's going to kind of shift, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all of these things. My prediction is that if anything, there will be a compensatory effect where people, you know, when you've been on a diet and you couldn't eat carbs and then you get carbs, what are you going to do? You're going to have a whole loaf of bread. And for me, that's what I see happening after this, because everyone I talk to is like, oh my God, when those borders open, I will go somewhere. I don't, I don't know where I just go somewhere. Right, so I don't know. So I, I, I guess I'm thinking, um, yeah, coronavirus is not a solution to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been looking at my notes because that was the final question I was going to ask both of you before we closed off was, what has uh, COVID-19 taught us about sustainable tourism? Well, so, I, I mean, I completely agree with Mitra, and I think I sort of alluded to it earlier, actually, that, um, I mean, what coronavirus has shown us is, is um, the, the alarming dependency on tourism around the world in terms of employment and income. Um, whether you're looking at the UK, which has suffered tremendously, or globally, it's, you know, tourism is ingrained in the global economy. Uh, but again, Mucha is, in my view, entirely correct to say that there is this kind of pent-up demand. Um, and, uh, and we've seen it already in Europe. As soon as, you know, from Northern Europe, we were able to suddenly go and travel to Spain and Portugal, Everybody did it. And then, you know, the problem in the UK was that the government then changed the rules and people found themselves stranded and having to come back to avoid quarantine. Uh, there is huge pent-up demand. Everybody wants to go away. And of course, 
in all the destinations, there was a huge pent up demand for tourists to come with their dollars and their pounds. Um, so the, in my view, the only thing which is probably one of the positives in a way to come out of coronavirus is that it, it is going to actually lead to, in the longer term, a rebalancing or certainly a, a rationalization of, of international transport. Uh, particularly airlines, that there is all the evidence suggests that most airlines will be reducing capacity, raising costs in the longer term, obviously not in the short term when they're trying to rebuild balance sheets. Uh, but the consensus is amongst the airline sector that prices will rise quite considerably over the next four to five years, maybe 50% more than they are now. In real terms, compared to 20 years ago, that's still cheap, you know, compared to what I used to pay for international travel 20 years ago for flights. Um, but it will dampen demand, no doubt. Uh, and um, from a privileged perspective, I would say that's a good thing because it, it will begin to nudge towards slower growth, if not steady state or degrowth. So I think that's the thing that's going to come out of, of coronavirus is probably a leaner, um, more effective industry. Um, and then subject to regulation in the future, which will have to come in terms of uh, aviation fuel and everything else, you know, duties on that. I, I believe we will move towards uh, a more steady state, if not degrowth, in, in, in airline travel. Okay, um, we've always said our welcome. So um, uh, thank you, Richard and, and, and Mucha. Uh, you've just answered the final question to many, uh, many of the researchers or many of the students who are watching today, uh, the answers to their assignment questions. So um, <laughs> thank you for that. So uh, before we officially close, I'd like to express a very big thank you to both of you um, for taking the time to share perspectives. Um, can I encourage those who are watching, if we haven't had, a, had time to go through your questions or in, in, in enough detail, please have a look at the work of both um, uh, Professor Sharpley and Dr. McConnell and you will find um, uh, that uh, that will answer some of your questions. I thank all the participants from across the globe for making the time to join us. Thanks to the team behind the cameras, uh, you can't see them but uh, Acting Director of CTR, Dr. Eiji Ito, Dr. Hayato Nagai, Ms. Masato Murano, and Ms. Maki Kobayashi, thank you so much for your, for your assistance. Um, our next webinar will, will feature um, the uh, uh, editor of the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, Professor James Hyam from the University of Otago in New Zealand, and he will be accompanied by University of Oxford's uh, Associate Professor Debbie Hopkins. And that's one that I'm, I'm looking forward to very much. It's on October the 21st at 5 p.m. Japan Standard Time. Please be sure to check your emails and look for announcements um, over the next few uh, weeks or so. Lastly, please complete the pop-up poll that you see now. As researchers, we always want to know what people think of things that we do. That will come up on your screen in a minute. Uh, but once again, uh, uh, finally, thank you to uh, Richard, um, Professor Richard Sharpley in England, uh, Dr. Mucha Mukono in Brisbane, in Queensland and to all of you wherever you are. Thanks again. Take care and see you next time. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you.